So I'm going to start off uh, by telling a little bit of the same story, but I guess my perspective on it is a little bit different than Ben's. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for coming here. Um, I, I'm so excited to be here, and I can't even tell you, like, 10 months after the first CSS Conf ever existed, here it is in Australia. It's, uh, it's kind of unbelievable and fantastic and really great to have you here. Um, so with a ton of help from other people, just like Ben, I organized the first CSS Conf in the US. And um, I'd been to lots of JavaScript conferences before that, um, and they sort of thought I was a designer. And I'd been to lots of uh, design conferences, and they thought I was a giant nerd. And I thought, wait, where, where are my people? Um, I kind of wondered you know, why CSS seemed like it kept falling in the cracks between design and development. Where was that space for CSS to exist as like, a nerdy discipline unto itself? Um, I wanted to hang out with CSS devs like you face to face. I wanted to spend time with people who loved um, and frankly also hated CSS just as much as I do. You know, hated it by knowing it really, really well. <laughs> Um, and so that's sort of what CSS Conf was born out of. Um, and very luckily, indeed, in the audience that day, right up there, there's a red circle, it's a little hard to see, um, was Christina. And she saw how much this could do for the community. And she thought, and I had been bugging her, kind of like I'd been bugging Ben, saying, hey, this should go to the EU, this should go to the EU. And she was always like, oh my god, so much work. I don't think I can do it. Um, and then she came to the US version, and she had such a good time that she said, this absolutely has to happen. She went back to Berlin and recruited Michael. And together, they decided to um, make CSS Conf EU happen. Um, luckily, in the audience that day was Ben. And so Ben, who I had been again maybe pressuring slightly to bring it to, to Australia. Well, the truth is, after we had CSS Conf in the US, uh, Australians kept saying, when's it coming here? When's it coming here? When's it coming here? Uh, you all are not shy about saying when you want something. Um, and so I was really impressed by that and thought, we have to find a way to make this happen. Um, and so I'd been bugging Ben, saying, hey, you know, this would be a good thing to do along with JSConf, you know, maybe think about it. And finally, when he came to the EU version, he was like, yeah, absolutely, this, this has to happen. I kind of think he wanted to do it all along, even though he was reticent about the amount of work. He seemed pretty excited about it straight away. Um, at least that's what I tell myself when I uh, worry that I pressured him too much. Um, so he came back here, like he said, assembled a team of Fiona, Tim, Glenn, and Michael, and they worked so incredibly hard that I'd love it if we could start off the day by just giving them a round of applause for all the work that they've done. Thank you, guys. The other important thing that I want you to think about is that next year it could absolutely be you up here on this stage. Um, CSS Conf is, uh, has the idea of being inclusive, that anybody could be speaking here, that you know, the cool thing that you work on in the next 12 months could be the thing that brings you up here onto this stage next year to present it to everybody else. So kind of keep that in the back of your head that this, is, this part of CSS Conf is also where you belong. Um, and that, that's an important part of it. Um, so let me move on. I have to say I'm really excited as well about the lineup that we have for you. Um, I think that they've chosen a great lineup, um, and I'm really excited about it. They are doing some amazing work. They're challenging some preconceived ideas and really pushing the boundaries of what's possible with CSS. I think you're going to see some stuff today that you wouldn't have even thought a person could do. Um, so I've been looking forward to Nicholas's talk about components and Leah talking about color. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, that Christopher is going to blow us away with his talk about testing CSS. That's a topic that's really close to my heart as well. Um, and I'm just hoping, as I was at EU, to keep up with Anna's talk at all about polygons, um, especially the math side. Um, so I really think that you're going to love their topics uh, as much as the organizers do and really understand why, uh, why they were chosen. So I want to ask you kind of a philosophical question, uh, which is, you know, why are you here? Why are you here today? What are you, what are you doing here? Um, and also say, I honestly have no idea, right? I don't know why you're here. Um, I would say that neither do you. Um, and in fact, even if you think you do, you actually don't know why you're here. Um, so when I come to a conference with a preconceived notion of like why I'm in that spot, I'm rarely right. Um, often there's something totally unexpected and kind of wonderful that happens when you get a group of like-minded developers together in the same place. 
Um, so maybe your boss sent you to learn new skills and bring them back to the company. That could be a thing. Um, maybe you brought yourself because your boss is a little bit disinterested in your skill set and you think that that's something that you need to pay attention to. Um, maybe it'll be to have a hallway conversation with someone that inspires you. Um, I think the hallway conversations are very underrated um, at conferences. Sometimes that ends up being the most important thing, more important than the speakers or the talks or anything else. Um, maybe you will meet someone here who will help you solve a really hard technical problem next month, uh, something you can't even imagine you're going to have to deal with yet. Um, or maybe you'll hear a talk about a new technology that you haven't played with and it'll capture your interest in your imagination. Um, maybe you're here to get re-energized. Maybe you're sort of bored or, or feeling in a rut. Um, maybe you're here to find your community. Um, and maybe you're here to realize that other people actually do love CSS uh, as much as you do. Um, one reason why I'm happy to be at CSS Conf is because I like the idea of balancing the time spent as a student and a teacher. Um, I don't know about yourself, but in my day-to-day -day work life, I'm the CSS expert, right? People are coming to me and they're asking, how do I do this? Is this code okay? Should I have done it this way? You know, can you give me a code review? Um, or they're giving me CSS that's all written that's uh, crazy pants, and I'm going and saying, wait a minute, could we maybe refigure this a little bit? Um, and so it's nice to be at a conference where there are lots of CSS experts, and I can take a step back in and step into the student role for a bit and be able to step out of that. I have to already know everything uh, role that can end up happening when you're the CSS expert in your company. Um, the word career is kind of an odd one. Uh, it rose in popularity in the latter part of the last century. Um, weirdly, it has its origins in French and Latin words for racetracks. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I think that focus on career rather than what brings you joy um, can make you end up feeling like you're running after some sort of abstract notion of success rather than pursuing your true interests. Um, you end up sort of scrambling uh, for you know, what you think matters instead of really following your heart. Um, so I would say uh, I welcome you to fuck your career and uh, follow your heart instead. Sort of, it's impossible to figure out how the things that you do day to day are going to fit into a big picture. Um, so I think it's important to uh, follow your gut, right? Um, to do stuff that interests you and stop doing things that don't interest you. And that's really hard, especially if you're good at them, right? Um, talk to people you enjoy and see what the developing relationship brings. Um, step out of your comfort zone and try a technology that you haven't known anything about before. There's a cartoon, I don't know if it was ever in Australia, it's called Family Circus. Do you have that? No, it's pretty dumb, so you're not missing out much. Um, anyway, <laughs> there's this uh, little boy in the cartoon called Billy, and he goes out to play in the neighborhood. They do these paths to show like what he did all day, sort of tramping around the neighborhood and playing with this and playing with that and running off into the neighbor's yard and back and climbing a tree and all this kind of thing. Um, and so they show that as like a sort of crazy dotted line to show how he spent his day. Uh, I read a research paper that showed that people who considered themselves the luckiest had the most variation in their day. They didn't take the same path to work every day. They didn't talk to the same people every day. They engaged in uh, different ways and they allowed there to be a lot of room in their life um, and unexpected tangents. And in allowing that space, they basically allowed room for the unexpected. Um, so perhaps this conference is that chance to allow room for you to have a chance meeting or a happy collaboration, to have that bit of luck that comes from doing something which is a little bit outside of what you usually do. Um, so the next part of my talk is a little bit self-indulgent, so I hope you'll bear with me, uh, but I swear it will probably all come together at the end. Um, a few years ago, John Alsop asked me to speak at a career event for college students. Actually, I it, was it in Sydney, I think? Um, yeah, it was definitely in Australia. Um, and we were meant to help those students understand like, if they wanted to be where we were one day, what did they need to do? What was the path? What are the steps along the route to get to this career? Um, and I'm not really quite sure that my story was what the teachers had in mind, to be perfectly honest. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, because I think it relates to that allowing space uh, for luck and chance in our lives. Um, I grew up in a teeny fishing village. Um, it was... Uh, a few miles by a few miles, it had 3,000 people. My high school was terrible. Um, I graduated seventh in my class without having any idea when the two world wars were. Um, I was sort of barely, barely educated uh, when I left there. 
Um, and so when I went to school, when I went to college, I was so excited. Uh, every semester the course catalog would come out and I would sign up for whatever caught my interest. I took uh, logic and chemistry and calculus, political economy of women, uh, economics of post-independence Africa, um, Buddhism sculpture, Indian classical dance, uh, Japanese history, biology, experimental economics. Uh, I took whatever seemed like the thing that drew my attention and seemed really cool and that I wanted to know about. Um, I took graduate level courses when they would let me, uh, but mostly just took whatever would catch my interest that semester. And it was kind of neat to see how these dispersed uh, topics would end up sort of tying in together and actually being interrelated. Um, but then came the moment where I had a pretty difficult conversation with my dad, who said, uh, you know, Nicole, we sent you to college to get a degree and get a good job. You have to think about graduating. And I was like, oh, graduating, huh. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, my family was very education focused, so we were going to school, but it was the kind of education that was focused on the job you were going to get afterwards. It wasn't really being educated for education's sake. Um, so, I sort of took that into account and said, all right, I do actually need to graduate at some point. Um, so what I did is I actually added up all the classes I'd taken, and I added up all the classes needed for all the majors and found the one that I was mathematically closest to having a degree in anyway, <laughs> and finished that one off. So I have a, an undergraduate degree in economics, as it turns out. Um, yeah, random. But sometimes these random things just sort of work out, uh, and sometimes they don't. So it turns out an undergraduate degree in economics gets you some pretty terrible jobs. Um, I was a credit report writer, and that is as awful a job as it sounds like it would be. Um, it, was, it was terrible. I had to call people up and get them to tell me stuff about their credit. It was awful. Um, anyway, so I wasn't really enough of a masochist to go to graduate school, which you'd have to to really do anything with economics. And anyway, my interest in economics mainly was because it was the mathematically most close uh, major to what I had taken already. Um, so I decided to pursue a long-time dream and um, become a carpenter. Um, and this is going to sound really random, but I had always wanted to. I'd done carpentry with my dad and my grandpa, but because of that education focus in my family, it wasn't a possibility. It wasn't even something they would consider letting me do. Um, so I called every place in the newspaper for a while, for several weeks, and I said, give me a chance, give me a chance. Finally, this guy says, um, come work with us for a week. If you don't suck, we might not fire you. And I was like, crap, okay, I'm gonna do it though. And so I did, and um, I ended up working in carpentry for three years. Um, I learned so much about constructing systems, reading plans, improvising when those plans don't work out, um, and standing on, literally, the quality of your work that you did before. You know, when you are a carpenter, one day you lay the framing, and the next day you lay the sheathing over the framing, and the next day you lay, um, you lay the tar paper over the sheathing, and the next day you lay the, uh, the shingles over that if you're building a roof. And when you do that, it means that every day you're walking on the quality of the work that you made before. And I feel like that it shouldn't be related to web development at all, but it, it absolutely has tied back in and sort of um, standing by the quality of the kind of websites that you build. Um, and then there was Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> so I swear this is going to tie in. Um, while I was a carpenter, I ended up randomly playing Dance Dance Revolution with John Alsop and Burt Boss in Japan. Um, I know, it seems completely random. I swear it will, it will be related. Um, we weren't anywhere near as good as those guys up there. We thought we were, and then a bunch of Japanese teenagers came and showed us up completely. Um, it ended up being super important, that Dance Dance Revolution game. Um, so after that, I hurt my hands really badly. I lost sensation up to my wrists. Uh, the doctors basically said I had to find a new line of work. Carpentry was too hard. I wasn't meant to be lifting heavy weight like that. I, I needed to find something else to do. Um, so I randomly moved to Paris. Uh, so all these things, you know, you, you make these choices and in the moment you just, you go with your gut and you don't know how it's all gonna add up, right? But it ends up kind of adding up. Um, I ended up, accidentally enrolling in engineering school in Paris. Um, my French was really terrible, and I thought it was a little night class in Java, and it turns out three months later my French had gotten better to the point where I realized, oh my goodness, I'm in engineering school. No wonder it's so hard. Um, 
But uh, while I was there, I was able to start working for an agency called Aquino. And they give me a chance to work on some of the biggest sites in Europe. And there, my love of sort of scale and performance and speed was born. Um, and because of the work that I had done there, Yahoo actually offered me the opportunity to move to the Silicon Valley and work in their exceptional performance team, working on uh, Wyslow and things like that. I thought that that was my thing. I thought that that was my career and that was what I was going to do. And then I got laid off. <laughs> and that was not in my plans. That was not what I thought would happen. Um, it was the sort of bad old days of Yahoo. Tons of people were being laid off. It was sort of the worst uh, economy in recent memory, at least in the US. And um, it was pretty terrifying. Um, weirdly, it connects back to Australia. Um, around the same time, John Alsop got in touch. Um, and he's asked me if I wanted to speak at Web Directions North. And you gotta love John because he's absolutely willing to give a chance to speak to a speaker who's never spoken anywhere before. He thought maybe I had good ideas. He thought, give me a chance, give me a shot and see how it goes. Uh, and he did. So that Dance Dance Revolution game uh, from years before all of a sudden turned out to be the reason why I became a speaker ever at all. Um, I never could have predicted that. It was just, sure, Dance Dance Revolution sounds fine. Let's go do that. Um, so that night, I was supposed to do the standard performance talk for John, um, talking about you know, front-end performance and why slow rules and all those things, which are you know, important, um, maybe a little on the boring side for that, for that particular thing, but I you know, kind of wanted to talk about it. But the organizer said, well, why don't you talk about your own stuff? Why don't you talk about what matters to you? And I was like, really? Someone's going to let me talk about my CSS ideas? And um, that night, I stayed up all night writing the first object-oriented CSS presentation that I would ever give. And that slide deck has uh, almost a half a million views, uh, which is just incredible. You can't predict that. You know, Somebody one night says, why don't you talk about your stuff instead of just giving, you know, talking about other people's stuff. And I was like, huh, I, I guess I could try that, you know? And so it's those moments where you make a decision because your gut says, go for it, and, and you don't know necessarily uh, how it'll end up, but it ends up being important. Um, it's sort of similar to how I started a company. Mainly did it because I got laid off and I didn't know what else to do, but it ended up working out really well. Um, it's also why I started CSSConf. I'd gone to JSConfs and I was like, hey, wait, I want this for us. I want this for my community. Um, I want us to start building a community. Um, so last summer, I watched a really silly romantic comedy. Um, it's called He's Just Not That Into You. Um, I'm not sure which of the details of this to give you because they're all a little bit vapid, but um, the, the rough idea is that the one on the bottom right corner there uh, is trying to date and she keeps going out on dates with guys and they keep not calling her back and they, they, you know, they're not making second dates and they're just sort of flaky and the one on the top right there is a bartender who starts giving her advice and says, you know, if they liked you, they'd call you back. If they're not calling you back, it's because they're just not that into you. And I had this like giant aha moment with this. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm just not that into my company anymore. I was like, I don't wanna call my company back. I don't wanna go out on another date. I was like, I dread the moments when I have to be working on you know, choosing a health plan for employees and all this stuff. And it was so hard because it was something that I'd poured years of love into and I wanted it to exist. I wanted it to be a thing. But I realized it just, I wasn't that into it anymore. And I couldn't be following my heart and doing that thing. Um, even though it gave me the chance to work with people like Fiona, who I would just feel absolutely graced and lucky that I got to work with someone who's such a skilled CSS coder, um, I still had to let it go. Um, so I quit. And truth be told, at that moment, I had no idea how that fit into the bigger picture. I had no idea if it was going to work out. I still, it's, you know, it's on the fence, but it seems good so far. Um, I ended up working for a company called Pivotal Labs, and they do 100% pairing. And so I've been able to work together with engineers side by side and have them basically take me from being pretty purely front end to being you know, a full stack developer. I write Ruby code every day. I change routes and controllers and models. I interact with a database. I do all kinds of stuff that I would have thought a year ago would have been impossible. 
Um, I've learned things like error messages are my friends. I always thought when I tried back-end coding that if I was getting error messages, it meant that I was doing it wrong. <laughs> it's a simple, silly thing, right? I didn't realize that the way that you code is by get, getting error message after error message moving further down in the stack and getting closer and closer to having um, your code actually work the full way through the stack. When I realized that, it was such an aha moment. I realized I'd been giving myself crap for years thinking that I was just not very skilled in this direction. And in fact, it was just a fundamental misunderstanding standing. Um, and if I hadn't been able to work with those engineers and watch them go through the same thing, I remember working with one engineer uh, one day, and he got, um, he got tears in his eyes, actually. He was so frustrated. I mean, it was very subtle. Uh, I didn't say anything because I didn't think that would really help much. But, uh, but like, he was so irritated. We'd been working for like three hours on this problem, and we could not figure out why the data wasn't showing up where it was supposed to. And I was like, oh. He feels like that too. Okay, maybe it's all right that sometimes I feel like that, and I feel like I'm not gonna be able to figure the thing out. Um, so that was great. Getting to see somebody else go through all those sort of emotions of code helped me to realize that my emotions around code were not that crazy and were actually fairly on track. Um, it's also helped me learn that there's so much I don't know, um, and I will keep learning and keep trying, and I think no matter how far I go, it's still gonna feel like there's so much that, that I don't know. Uh, they, my view of all the things I could possibly learn seems to increase so much faster than the scope of what I've actually learned so far. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's okay. So why am I here? Back to that question again. Um, I don't know, right? I, I don't know uh, if it was the right thing to, um, to have a CSS be a smaller part of what I was doing every day and to take on uh, writing Ruby and writing JavaScript and writing you know, uh, database stuff and things like that um, and Rails. Uh, but I do know that I'm having more fun than I've had in ages, that I got excited and reinvigorated about CSS. All of a sudden, it's this fun thing that gets to be my one moment of competence in the middle of a day where I'm doing all things that I don't know very much about. Um, and so it made me feel really strongly positive about, about CSS again. Um, I'm blogging about things that I'm terrible about, about you know, I, a terrible at. I write about uh, Ruby and then people write back to me and say, actually, you're totally wrong about that. And it's horrible and also wonderful um, to be in a position where I set myself up to learn so much by knowing so little. Um, so beyond that, I... I feel like I'm just moving toward the things that are giving me energy and seem interesting and seem engaging. And uh, what's sort of driving me is to cut out stuff I'm not interested in anymore and to engage with stuff that, that feels um, uh, energizing for me. Um, and then to trust that you know, when I look back five years from now, it's all gonna seem like it fit into a nice row. Like, you know, I look back and being a carpenter really has helped me be a better web developer. But at the time when I was making the transition, I was like, oh my God, I can't work anymore. My hands are hurt and I have no idea what I'm gonna do. I do actually need to make money and have, and have like a job and things like that. Um, so there are those moments where you, you don't know but it's sort of trusting that uh, ultimately it all kind of works out if you follow your heart. Um, so why are you here? Let's get back to that. Um, I would say follow your heart and we will find out. Um, in those critical life-changing moments, you so rarely know it's either critical or life-changing. Uh, follow your heart, dare to talk to someone you admire, talk to one of the speakers or somebody else that's here today that's done something you think is cool. Uh, get involved in an open source project. As CSS developers, there are a lot of ugly open source projects out there that we could make a lot better. So I think we should get involved, you know? Jump in and participate more fully in the community. Um, maybe you'll never have thought you were interested in SVG until you hear Chris Wright's talk. Um, maybe after Chris Epstein's talk, you'll want to get involved in the preprocessor community and, and shape the future of what SAS is going to do. Um, maybe Connor will inspire you to find connections between product design and the code that you write every day. Um, and maybe Simurai will make you think differently about theming. Who knows uh, why you're here? So I suggest you go out today and discover the secret of why you are here. Um, the thing that you couldn't have planned for in advance because it arises out of bringing this community together um, with these amazing developers, an incredible set of speakers, and a fabulous uh, uh, community of organizers that put this together for you. 
Thank you very much.